Good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to the 34th Regulatory Information Conference. I'm also happy to announce it's Happy uh, International Women's Day, so congratulations to all the women who make the world go round. I'm Andrea Vell, Director of the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, and it is a great honor to be here today and to have this opportunity to welcome everyone on behalf of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And our, our co-sponsors, the RIC, with our partners in the Office of Nuclear Reactor, or excuse me, Nuclear Regulatory Research, led by Mr. Raymond First now. We partner with the entire agency to bring to you an engaging conference that addresses how the agency is preparing for tomorrow. Ray? Thanks, Andrea. It's an honor to be here and to once again co-sponsor the RIC with you and, and your office. Uh, as of this morning, we've got over 3,600 participants registered, and I know I'm really looking forward to the next two and a half days. Next, I'd like to welcome uh, Joseph Goodridge from our Office of uh, Nuclear Security and Incident Response, who will sing our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave Thanks to Joseph for his uh, outstanding performance of the national anthem. And thanks to all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to engage with us this week. I also wanted to recognize former chairmen and commissioners that are joining us virtually this week. Uh, that includes former chairman Meserve, McFarlane and Burns and former commissioners Merrifield, Apostolakis and Magwood. We thank you for your prior service to the NRC and your continued involvement in nuclear reactor regulation. Andrea, back to you. This year's program is comprised of two and a half days, which feature morning keynote plenary sessions, followed by sets of concurrent technical sessions. We open this year's RIC with an opportunity to hear from our chairman, the Honorable Christopher Hansen. The plenary sessions this morning will feature remarks from our commissioners, the Honorable Jeff Barron and the Honorable David Wright. Plenary sessions tomorrow will include the introduction of our new Executive Director for Operations, Mr. Dan Dorman, and remarks from special guest speaker, the Honorable Jennifer Granholm, Secretary of Energy. Tomorrow, two plenary sessions will be focused on key topics, as this week marks the 11th anniversary of the Fukushima accident one of our special plenaries will provide an update on decommissioning efforts. The other special plenary to session tomorrow is titled, Women Belong in All Places Where Nuclear Safety Decisions Are Being Made, Amen. This session will be introduced by our chairman, Christopher Hansen, and will feature an interview with Ms. Romina Velshi, President and Chief Executive Officer, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. The interview will be conducted by Ms. Brooke Clark, the NRC's next secretary of the commission, and congratulations to Brooke. We have 30 technical sessions between the afternoons of today and tomorrow, 
and Thursday morning. And thanks to our virtual platform, you're free to move from session to session should you desire. In addition, all of this year's sessions are being recorded and will be made available for viewing on our website after the conference. Some of those technical sessions will be chaired by our commissioners. For example, today at one o'clock Eastern, Chairman Hansen will chair the session on pre-application engagements for new and advanced reactors. Today at 3 p.m. Eastern, Commissioner Wright will chair the session on reimagining the role of nuclear and energy and the electric grid. Tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, Commissioner Barron will chair the regional session on reactor inspection program, leaving tomorrow behind. Also on this year's virtual conference platform, we have 13 very engaging digital exhibits and a virtual tour of the NRC Incident Response Center. I encourage everyone to check out the wide range of exhibit topics at your leisure before or after our technical sessions. Just like last year, you the attendees will be able to submit questions electronically to the session moderator for consideration during the session's question and answer period. Attendees will also have the opportunity to contribute to the discussion by participating in live polling in some of our sessions. Our digital exhibits will have contact information since you have of questions or feedback for the staff. Each year, the planning and execution of a conference of this magnitude would not happen without the hard work and dedication of so many, including our NRC staff, our contractor partners, and a wide array of panelists and speakers. So I want to take this first opportunity to thank everyone involved in the RIC this year. Now I have the distinct honor of introducing our chairman. The Honorable Christopher T. Hansen was designated chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission by President Joe Biden, effective January 20th, 2021. He was sworn in as a commissioner on June 8th, 2020. Chairman Hansen has more than two decades of government and private sector experience in the field of nuclear energy. Prior to joining the NRC, he served in various roles, including staff member on the Senate Appropriations Committee, senior advisor in the Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy and the Office of the Chief Financial Officer and consultant at Booz Allen Hamilton. Chairman Hansen earned master's degrees from Yale Divinity School and Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, where he focused on ethics and natural resource economics. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Religious Studies from Valparaiso University in Valparaiso, Indiana. Welcome Chairman Hansen. We're looking forward to your remarks. Thank you, Andrea, for that introduction. Thank you, Joseph, for that beautiful rendition of our national anthem. And I'll start with a few more thank yous. First, thank you all for attending the work virtually this year. Welcome to everyone who's tuning in from their homes, offices, coffee shops, public parks, across the US and around the world. I might have said this last year, but I really am optimistic that we'll get to do this in person next year. This is our second virtual RIC, and once again, I'm incredibly impressed by the dedication of the NRC staff in putting on what will be an interesting and informative three days of panel discussions, speeches, and other virtual events. I hope you all take advantage of the virtual platform to learn new things and join conversations. To Andrea, Ray, their teams, the clever CIO crew, and the many others who make the RIC possible, a heartfelt thank you. As Andrea mentioned, the RIC this year, again, begins on International Women's Day. This year, we have two sessions dedicated to highlighting the incredible contributions that women continue to make to nuclear regulation and global policy. I particularly want to thank the women whose talents continue to make the NRC the gold standard around the world. Tomorrow, I'm looking forward to a discussion with President Ramina Velshi of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, where you will hear me reaffirm my commitment to gender equity and an inclusive NRC. I'd also like to thank my colleagues on the commission. We've accomplished a lot in the last year, even though we didn't always agree. Having different perspectives while continuing to work together is imperative to the health of our institution. Finally, 
I'd like to say thank you to my staff, both my permanent staff and those who joined me on rotation, not only for their efforts to prepare me for the RIC this year, no small task, but also for their hard work over the past year. We've kept up a remarkable pace and they have not let up. So thank you to Kathleen Blake and Patty Jimenez, Molly Marsh, Cynthia Roman, Tony Nakanishi, Olivia Makula, Mandy Maurer, Lisa Dimmick, Ipo Gonzalez, Mike Clark, and Margaret Severa, who I forgot to thank last year. Like all of you, I've been monitoring the situation in Ukraine with grave concern. My heart goes out to the people of Ukraine in this desperate time. The Russian Federation's violation of Ukraine's sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity is a tragedy with wide-ranging impacts. The unprecedented nature of Russia's actions on Ukrainian nuclear safety, security, and safeguards hits especially close to home for the NRC. At the NRC and across the US government, we share IAEA Director General Grossi's concerns about, Russians, about Russia's actions and echo his call to refrain from any measures that could jeopardize the security of nuclear materials or the safe operation of Ukraine's nuclear facilities. I'd like to commend our partners at the State Nuclear Regulatory Inspectorate of Ukraine for their continuous updates to the IAEA and the international community, despite the obvious challenges they're facing. I also want to highlight the bravery and dedication of Ukrainian regulatory and operational staff in carrying out their essential duties in the face of extraordinarily trying and dangerous circumstances. The NRC will continue to remain engaged with its U.S. government colleagues to monitor the situation, and we will stand in solidarity with our Ukrainian regulatory partners. We will continue our longstanding support to Ukraine as it works to protect, sustain, and if necessary, restore the safe and secure operation of its nuclear facilities. Last year, I spoke about my initial approach to my tenure at the NRC, and I painted a picture of the NRC as an institution with three related efforts in the form of a triangle with risk-informed regulation, agency transformation, and diversity inclusion at each vertex. Undergirding that triangle are three pillars, regulatory independence, data, and the people who form the agency. This year, I wanna build on that foundation and talk about the NRC's role as an effective trusted regulator by highlighting three concepts, process, accountability, and legitimacy. You've heard many people, myself included, say that the NRC must not be an impediment to the safe use of nuclear power and materials, new or existing. But what does that mean? And what happens if the NRC doesn't get it right? I'm talking about this from two perspectives. First, what is most often talked about, having a regulatory framework that applicants and licensees, as well as the general public, can successfully understand and navigate, tailored to the risk profiles associated with the reactors and materials in question. And second, licensing and oversight that does not miss any safety significant issues, thus calling into question our framework. As I see it, the NRC is an integral part of deploying new nuclear, even if we're not building or promoting it. Without a license from a credible, trusted regulator, society simply will not accept it. As a federal agency, we are ultimately accountable to the American people. I fully understand that we don't regulate to assuage the public's fears, but we must acknowledge that there are fears around nuclear and consider how those fears affect deployment. This is particularly relevant considering the recent seizure of nuclear facilities in Ukraine, resulting in an attack and fire at the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. Such recent events have understandably been very alarming to the general public. And to understand the public's concerns, we have to look at what information, misinformation, and disinformation is being received and how that information 
or misinformation or disinformation is being used by the public to assess risk. Domestically, we find ourselves in a time of what the RAND Corporation cleverly calls truth decay and what the writer Jonathan Rausch has called an epistemic crisis. Folks are just having a hard time telling truth from fiction. Truth decay has also contributed to a decline in the trust of government. I don't wanna get sidetracked by talking about the pandemic, but I think it's really highlighted individuals' ability to sift through information and assess risk. And it has shown the wide spectrum of risk tolerance among individuals and the general distrust of government. I try to keep this in mind when I shape my decisions. In the past few years, as climate change and energy security have come to the fore as existential threats, many have rallied around nuclear as the solution for clean power, including many you would not expect. There's a wave of excitement around getting new reactors online quickly, and the NRC is necessarily caught up in that wave. But a note of caution. Let me quote former NRC chairman Dale Klein whose advice I've greatly appreciated during my tenure at the agency. In a speech in 2007, he said, and I quote, if the nuclear power business is treated with less than the seriousness it deserves, and people begin to think that anyone can just jump on the nuclear bandwagon, it opens up the very real danger of making the wave of a nuclear resurgence look more like a bubble, and bubbles have a tendency to pop, unquote. The NRC has an obligation to remain independent of the excitement and hold on to our objectivity rather than let ourselves be pushed by the wave or caught in a bubble. We're independent, but not isolated. Independence is an imperative for effectiveness and public trust. Yet we must also transform how we work so we can meet new demands while never losing sight of our core responsibilities overseeing existing uses of nuclear power and materials. Everyone, industry and the public, benefits from a trusted independent regulator. One of the most important characteristics of an effective regulator is having a clear and transparent processes in place to ensure objective decision-making. Licensing a nuclear reactor is necessarily a meticulous process. And while flexibility will be important for new designs, the process and guardrails must be sufficiently predictable for applicants and transparent and understandable for the public. Some people will roll their eyes and say, leave it to a government bureaucrat to give a speech defending the process. But hear me out. I've said that nuclear safety is an epistemological question. What do we know? How do we know it? And what difference does it make? The how is just as important as the other pieces of that formulation. As we further risk inform our approaches to implementing our regulations, and even as we further develop more performance-based approaches, process oftentimes gains greater importance. Novel concepts continue to emerge, and the agency must meet these challenges with flexibility. However, maintaining process as an integral part of our regulatory framework is one way we can continue to ensure adequate protection in all that we do. We ask our kids to show their work in math class so they and we can see the process from point A to point B. If the answer is wrong, then we can help them go back through and find the error. Similarly, when applicants come to us with new reactor designs, we look not only at their claims of performance or safety, but importantly at their methodology for reaching those conclusions. The old adage applies here too, show your work. And finally, there's the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA, a law often misunderstood and frequently maligned by both supporters and detractors. What does NEPA require? It requires the evaluation of environmental impacts of a federal action or decision, and it allows the public to review and comment on that evaluation. It's rightly understood or thought of as a process law. People understandably look to NEPA to give them a voice in government decision-making. In short, process matters. And this brings us to the next two concepts I wanna highlight, accountability and legitimacy. 
All that process provides accountability. We're accountable to the public, applicants and licensees, other federal agencies, states and tribes, and we're accountable to ourselves. When done correctly, the process determines objectivity in the outcome. Outside parties can look at our processes and validate whether we did what we said we were going to do. We expect the same of our licensees. Indeed, some of our most significant enforcement actions involve falsification of documentation, that is, a violation of the process, which is significant because it calls into question conclusions about safety or security. It undermines the how we know what we know. A big part of accountability is maintaining a safety culture where everyone in the organization is willing to raise concerns and, turn, and in turn make corrections if they're warranted. As President Biden says, when you mess up, fess up. And I would add, fix it. That goes for the commission as well as the staff. Finally, process confers legitimacy and credibility on our decisions. Ordinary individuals are not likely to understand the technical details of some of our reviews, but they're much more likely to understand our process, at least in general terms. First, we looked at X, then we independently reviewed Y, then we analyzed Z, and so on. Process is the way the public knows they can trust us when we reach a safety conclusion. Legitimacy and credibility must be earned and fervently held, upheld and protected. At the foundation of our legitimacy is the core technical competence of the NRC staff in which I have full faith. But we must continue to invest in the people who make up the agency and bring in new talent, both with their own expertise and the ability to learn from our existing staff. There are a lot of competing demands on the NRC staff. Our top priority must, be, must continue to be the oversight of existing reactors and uses of materials. For years, as the nuclear industry shrank, ha has been shrinking, the NRC was told to shrink too, and we did. Since 2014, the number of operating nuclear power plants has shrunk by 10%, and the NRC staff has shrunk by more than 20%. Meanwhile, the excitement outside the NRC is on new reactors and building them quickly. We've been changing course to be ready and we're doing our best to have the necessary resources in place. A key indicator of our legitimacy going forward is our ability to continue to transform our inward facing and outward facing processes. Ideally, citizens, applicants, and licensees will see modernization of government at the same pace and scale that they see in the private sector. That's not easy. Transformation for me has never, repeat never, been about cutting regulations or staff. For me, it's about making better regulatory decisions by bringing our data and the full expertise of the agency to bear on an issue. Sometimes that results in greater focus in some areas, and less than others, depending on risk significance. I'm willing to follow the data. For many in the agency, transformation has been extra duty, which people have been largely willing to do, but it's not sustainable. Our people have been stretched thin by multiple demands and the COVID public health emergency. Transformation, rather than being an exciting initiative, has in many cases become a burden. And sometimes what we call transformation is really just internally shifting responsibilities rather than truly rethinking what needs to be done, why, and which parts of the organization are best suited to the task. For me, our transformation efforts are inextricably linked to the hiring initiative spearheaded by our EDO, Dan Dorman, and our chief human capital officer, Mary Lamry. Annual attrition at the NRC is running about 7%, which means we need to hire roughly 200 people a year just to stay at curtain staffing levels. A level, by the way, that we know will not be sufficient to meet the challenges of the future. Not when 24% of our people are over the age of 60 and 55% are over the age of 50, all of them looking forward to a very well-earned retirement. And we need to expand our perspective about how, who, and where we are recruiting. 
Building the diverse workforce of the future and agency transformation go hand in hand. Equally important, transformation is about preparing the agency for a range of possible futures, potentially a wide range of possible futures. With regard to nuclear reactors, we have an existing fleet, some of which are decommissioning and some of which are continuing to optimize their operations and seeking to extend their licenses out to 80 years. We have to get our house in order on NEPA and continue to efficiently review applications for subsequent license renewal. Then we have new light water reactor designs with a lot of technological adjacency with the existing fleet poised for near-term deployment. And we have advanced reactors, which build off decades of research and development in fuels and materials that have the potential to greatly expand the economic use cases for nuclear power. With developments in fuels and materials, we've seen increased engagement on uranium enrichment, fuel fabrication and transportation, Therefore, our forecasts and preparations for the future must address all segments of the nuclear fuel cycle. Also in the materials area, we have a growing number of agreement states, 39 to date, and we have two additional applications. We must adjust to state agencies taking on more of the materials licensing and oversight role by taking a close look at our inspection procedures, our integrated materials performance evaluation program, and capacity building among new agreement states. There are advances in nuclear medicine with an expanding array of radioisotopes and treatment modalities. Patients and their families should be able to continue to count on us to efficiently evaluate new technologies and oversee the safe and secure use of these materials. Finally, the security and incident response situation is constantly shifting, especially with regard to cybersecurity international events, and domestic political polarization. Our partnerships across government, federal, state, tribal, local, are crucial to our security awareness and posture, emergency preparedness, and incident response. It's a dynamic situation, to put it mildly, and I didn't even talk about fusion. I don't know which future will come to pass, but I do know that any future will require a flexible, efficient, transparent regulatory framework implemented by experts dedicated to continuous learning and improvement. My view is that we've made significant pro progress over the last couple of years. By way of example, I wanna spend a minute or two talking about the development of our risk-informed performance-based regulatory framework for advanced reactors, also known by its proposed place in the Co Code of Federal Regulations, Part 53. The staff's taken an innovative approach to development of this rule by engaging stakeholders early and often in the process. We've received feedback, sometimes, even oftentimes conflicting, from many stakeholders addressing key issues, such as the use of probabilistic risk assessment and risk information more generally, appropriate criteria for a performance-based approach, and how to accommodate a wide range of both technologies and technological maturity levels in the advanced reactor community. I've been substantially involved in this effort, receiving regular updates from the staff, as well as hearing directly from stakeholders. And let me say this, I've been pleased with the approach and the progress the staff is making. Work is ongoing, but they're being thoughtful and deliberate, taking care to maintain some adjacency to existing frameworks, while being creative where needed to craft a balanced and protective rule. I have every confidence that the staff will produce a rule that adequate adequately protects people and the environment while allowing a range of technologies and licensing approaches in the timeframe set out by the commission. While the, ag while the agency develops the new framework, the staff is working commendably within our existing regulations to review reactor applications and topical reports that are ready now. I started this speech talking about the importance of process, its importance for objectively determining reasonable assurance of adequate protection, for accountability, and for public trust and legitimacy, not just for the NRC, but for the entire industry.
And I've talked a lot about change. One of the key themes of my speech last year was change in the context of an institution. Adapting is essential, but in doing so, we must preserve and further the goals of the institution, adequately protecting people in the environment and overseeing the safe and secure use of nuclear power and materials. To be an effective regulator, we must be careful we don't create instability in the institution. It could throw things off balance and undermine our legitimacy. It is a challenge to which we must rise, and I know we will. So we need to do several things at once. First, we need to uphold our institutional values, stay true to our principles of good regulation, independence, openness, efficiency, clarity, and reliability. Second, we need to continue to risk and form our regulations so we're focused on the most safety and, safety and security significant issues by leveraging data and training our people. We need to apply modern technology to yield safety and security insights, to communicate more clearly, and to streamline and modernize our business processes. In other words, we need to drive change in the context of our overall mission and values. And finally, and perhaps most crucially, we need to recognize each other as the future of nuclear safety and security, and as the bearers of the sacred trust of the American people. The NRC is just people. That's all it is. That's all any organization is. Honest, smart, and talented, yet fallible. Dedicated and engaged, yet weary after two years of a pandemic. Creative and eager, yet unsure about the future. Together, we will honor the work of those who came before us, and we will sustain the institution as we advance. Thank you for listening and for attending this year's RIC. Andrea, back to you. Thank you, Chairman, for number one, laying out so many themes um, in such an eloquent way in such a short period of time. And this is a reminder to those on the platform, if you have questions, you can select the uh, Q&A tab in the upper right-hand box and type your questions in. So whenever you're ready, Chairman, I have the first question ready for you. Go for it. Okay, the first question is, you discussed the NRC not being a hurdle for new and advanced reactor technology. The NRC has yet to fully approve new reactor technology. How can the NRC ensure that its processes are not causing new and advanced reactor technology to wither on the vine? Uh, great question. I think one of, the, one of the main things we can do is really, and I'm gonna have a, a session on this, this is just this afternoon, so I appreciate kind of the tee up on this, is really pre-application activities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and um, as much uh, pre-application activity as, uh, as, as applicants um, are ready for, uh, and, and on specific um, technical topics, um, so that uh, you know, the staff is already familiar with the technology that comes in. It's already familiar with the fuel types and the materials and the other technical aspects that we might receive. Uh, I, I really, uh, part of the um, uh, discussion this afternoon will be about uh, lessons learned from uh, GE and TerraPower and, and Kairos uh, on this front and, and, uh, and, and things that I'm sure the NRC can be doing better in this space too. So we're really leaning into these, um, to these, en uh, these engagements, this interaction, and, uh, and we'll continue to do that. Right, uh, next question. Do you expect acceleration in applications for new nuclear power plants as a result of high energy prices? Um, that's a great question. I mean, the, the, the issue I think is, is probably gonna be natural gas prices. Um, you know, there, there isn't a lot of, of oil uh, fueled power plants uh, <laughs> uh, in the country. And so um, sometimes natural gas and oil prices move together and sometimes they don't. And, and we'll just have to see. Um, uh, I think one of the interesting things about some of these newer designs is the idea that they can be built and deployed more quickly, and, and that potentially changes the economics in terms of uh, response to energy prices uh, going forward. So we'll have to kind of, um, kind of see on that. I, 
at least in the public announcements that we've seen out in the world that I think everybody's seen out in the world is much more about uh, decarbonizing um, power production for, uh, the you know, at least from some of the major utilities in this country. And so I think carbon um, is a major issue, but certainly uh, energy prices um, could be a factor as well. This next question has to do with transformation, and it first thanks you for your statement on transformation. You mentioned transformation versus just shifting responsibilities. This is a large undertaking, and as you said, we have decreased the size of staff, putting us at a disadvantage and having sufficient resources to conduct change while ensuring our mission. How do we best carve out time and resources to really transform and what risk appetite does the commission and senior managers have for real transformation? Well, that's, that's a great question. And there are a lot of questions in there. So <clears throat> I think I'll probably start with the last one and kind of move up. I mean, I have a lot of appetite for transformation. <laughs> um, I was having this discussion with my, with my staff uh, on a trip a few weeks ago. And, and I said, boy, I, you know, I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to understand more about both what's going on in the agency. And, and I've done that some. And, 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 and at one point, they kind of threw up their hands and they said, well, what do you want on transformation? I said, I want more. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, so, I, I, you know, I, I think particularly on the, on the business side, I mean, I, I, you know, I look at it as, as, um, uh, you know, one of the strategic imperatives I think of, of transformation is, is really around exactly what this person is asking, right? Whereas the agency shrunk. But the mission, in a lot of ways, the scope has kind of stayed the same, right? We, the, the operating reactors has changed somewhat, but we still have a lot of licensing actions. We've got a lot of interest on advanced reactors um, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and yet, uh, like a lot of government agencies, we've got uh, demographic um, pressures uh, on us. And so um, how do we use transformation to focus on the most... Um, important activities, right, um, uh, um, that we have. And, you know, and I want to say this is, this is a little uh, inside of the agency, but I know a lot of that line staff have felt that burden of, of transformation. And so I think that augmenting our staff in, in some ways, you know, pushing ahead with this hiring initiative that Dan and Mary have going is really critical um, in order to provide some relief uh, you know, um, uh, you know, there's kind of that adage, you have to spend money to make money. This is kind of the same thing, right? You need a few extra people around to actually drive change in the organization because the, so that, so that everybody has a little bit more bandwidth to do that. That's really the idea there. All right. This next question um, has to do with software digitalization, which is a mouthful to say for me, what are your views on software digitalization and how we make our fleet safer and more cost effective. Uh, so I assume this is a digital instrumentation and control question, um, which is also a mouthful. Mm -hmm. uh, look, this is something that I've been very interested in um, uh, since I came to the agency um, about how we get again that uh, you know I, I people have heard me talk about having a regulatory line of sight. Uh, on some of these things and getting um, clarity on that, um, revisiting um, uh, where necessary the, what is it, the 1993 uh, policy on common cause failure and, and getting some, um, uh, you know, getting some regulatory transparency, clarity, certainty, whatever you want to call it on that issue um, uh, for licensees, all while we're making sure that we've got appropriate redundancy where necessary. Um, we've got the, um, the firewalls in place where necessary, hardware uh, as well as software to protect these systems. Um, look, I mean, I'm very uh, uh, interested in this issue, both on the, the technical side of this, but also on the human factor side, which I think is another, um, which is another thing um, we can and, and should be interacting with applicants and licensees on. Um, so I think it's I, I think it's important. Each utility will make their own um, business decision about whether or not to invest in that. It's it's not an insignificant cost to them. I understand that, but I I'm committed to um, having um, at least for the NRC's part 
again, a, a, um, a predictable and, and clear process um, uh, for addressing digital INC. Okay, toward the end of your remarks, you mentioned fusion. So this question has to do with fusion. What might the role of the NRC be in the use of nuclear fusion? That's a great question. We're, I think we're trying to figure that out, right? Because in some cases, it depends on the fusion technology itself. In some cases, it might be perfectly appropriate uh, because it falls under part 20 that our agreement state partners uh, are gonna be involved in that. So it's not just a matter for us. I mean, there are kind of key regulatory issues about uh, activation products and um, uh, uh, tritium and, and some other things that, that um, I think the staff is still learning about and, and thinking about where that fits. Um, also this issue of having a burning plasma and what the, what the risk significance of that is and what the safety systems are. Um, so I, you know, I, I wasn't trying to neglect fusion. <laughs> I'm actually really interested in this topic. Uh, um, uh, but we're still, we're still kind of, we're still figuring that out. I think we're in learning mode. We're hearing from stakeholders, uh, both individually and collectively with the fusion industries association. We're hearing from our state, uh, agreement state partners on this as well. And, um, and, and, and we're starting to, to kind of piece this together. Uh, next question. Internationally, there's a great interest in globally accepted licenses. How is the view of NRC? Will you accept design approvals from other regulators? Are there any activities in this direction? Um, there, I will, I'll acknowledge that there are a lot of, uh, there's, there is interest in this, uh, you know, what's, what's kind of called harmonization. Um, uh, but I'll uh, echo my, my colleague in the UK. Uh, we had a, he and I and, and President Felshi from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission um, were in a discussion with uh, Director General Grossi. And, uh, and my, my, my British counterpart, uh, Mark Foy, uh, we were talking about harmonization and this was something that the Director General's very interested in. And, uh, and, and Mark had a, had a thing that was kind of like, yes, 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 but sovereignty, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and sovereignty is really important um, because, um, you know, I'm not accountable to the British people. I'm accountable to the American people and the American people look to us, look to the NRC for us to make our own determinations um, and in a way to re reflect um, uh, the risk tolerance and the kind of the, the, um, the policy environment that we're in. Now, having said that, right, the, um, the laws and the theories and principles of physics work in the United States the same way they do in Canada and Britain and Poland and other places, right? So is, the, are, is there room to collaborate on, um, on the technical aspects of, of advanced reactors? Absolutely, and we have a memorandum of cooperation with Canada doing exactly that. Um, where we're um, sharing um, uh, information and approaches. Now, is that a universal license? No, but at the same time, uh, and, and, I, and I don't think it should be, uh, frankly, but at the same time, um, you know, does that mean that every um, uh, applicant has to come up with an entirely new set of information or data? Well, I think that's probably where, where there's some work that can be done. Okay, um, next question. How has the COVID-19 pandemic affected your risk-informed decision-making and how has the NRC addressed the challenges? Oh boy, that's a, gr that's a great question. I've been so proud of the NRC staff and the way we've, we've adapted. I mean, and, and some of this was just some, some really great foresight by our, our chief information officer, uh, Dave Nelson, who, you know, we moved from desktops to laptops probably six months before the pandemic. And, uh, and boy, aren't we glad we did! And he had he had made a number of a, a number of other investments internally. Um, so uh, you know, when the pandemic hit, I think other agencies were getting you know supplemental and emergency appropriations for hundreds, you know, tens and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to kind of upgrade their infrastructure. I think the NRC we got you know three million, uh, <laughs> and it was to improve kind of the bandwidth into the building and really help people do VPN and a couple of other real minor things. I'm just so impressed and, and proud. And we've adapted in, in all kinds of other ways. Um, 
I do think, though, that, and I've said this at, at commission meetings, right? That nuclear safety and security is a—it's a contact sport, right? It's boots on the ground. Um, there's there's nothing quite like uh, having NRC people around with our with our NRC badges and our NRC hard hats uh, in facilities and checking things out. And so, while we were able to do some things like remote inspections, or uh, you know, some materials inspections remotely and some other things, those were really important in the pandemic, right? People didn't want us going into hospitals. Our people didn't want to go into hospitals. Um, you know, that was kind of sufficient temporarily, but not something um, that we necessarily want to do in the long term. On the other hand, you know, you look at our resident inspectors and, you know, very quickly our licensees provided them with remote access uh, into their systems, either by providing laptops or VPN or whatever. So there were things that they could do uh, remotely, review documents um, uh, and, and other things without having to be um, uh, uh, on on site for some of those um, uh, direct sampling. So, I think we're working on a lessons learned in the agency. That's been kind of an ongoing process, and and I know we're going to share the results of that uh, publicly um, when we when we kind of crystallize some of those lessons. Okay, this next question is long and it's multifaceted, so I'm going to speak slowly. <laughs> Get ready. Okay. Um, NRC regulatory processes within nuclear reactor regulation benefit from a clear set of procedures that were first developed in the mid-1990s to clarify the myriad of regulatory guidance into clear standards for regulation. Processes in other areas, for example, decommissioning, new reactor designs, etc., rely on regulatory guidance rather than clear rules. Clear rules in these other areas are definitely needed. Since these diverse areas cannot be addressed simultaneously, where and how would you prioritize rulemaking in select areas? That's a great question. <laughs> I mean, this is this gets to the heart of uh, um, a lot of our efforts on Part Fifty Three and advanced reactors, right? It's that it's the it's along that spectrum between predictability and flexibility, and and where should we where should we be in that, right? Where where do we have rules on the flexibility part, and where do we have guidance? We've gotten a lot of feedback on that on that question, right? Our staff and 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 not all of it entirely. Um, entirely consistent. And I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where we should be on that continuum because, because I think in different issues, we're going to be in different places. Um, I think having that option for having clear rules or having guidance uh, lets us evaluate each one of these things kind of individually. Now we have to learn, we have to, to be cognizant that, uh, that there's some consistency in there um, right. We can't kind of do this. We can't, you know, pick one end of the spectrum or the other at, at random. Um, uh, um, uh, but I do agree that having a, uh, a set of, of procedures is important. I mean, um, uh, um, the, uh, um, you know, we've got a couple of papers in front of the commission on this. Uh, 5046C, I think, is an example of that, where we're, you know, that paper, I think, the, the staff proposes um, to be more on the procedure end of, and the predictability end of things. Uh, likewise, a rulemaking plan for um, uh, a higher enrichment, higher burnout fuel, which is another paper in front of the commission, right? Um, uh, Again, having rulemaking around those things rather than guidance. There are going to be other things, though, um, that are that are more appropriate on the other end of the spectrum. All right. Now you use this word in your speech, and I remember trying to pronounce it out. And so here comes in a question again. Uh, your framing of regulations as epistemological work. Yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah. Uh, seems insightful and suited to the time we're living in. Can you say more about the what the NRC can do to safeguard its interactions with stakeholders in an era of truth-challenged public discourse in which you talked about truth decay? Yeah, truth decay. That's, uh, that's a great question. I was having a conversation with our Office of Public Affairs staff, <laughs> who, uh, who I think who feel this challenge particularly acutely uh, 
uh, in the agency, but I think everybody does. Um, and I, I, th I think that um, one of the key things we can do is just be as open and as transparent as possible. And I, you know, the NRC has done a remarkable job over that over the years. I mean, people complain about Adams, <laughs> our, docu our online document management system, but literally everything is out there. Um, you know, we have public dockets. We have, you know, um, uh, you know, with the exception of, of some business sensitive information, some security information, we really do um, make everything uh, uh, available. I think in, sometimes the NRC can do a better job of the translation function, and but the translation function is is isn't easy, um, and and there are some concepts that um, that don't always lend themselves to translation. But I had this. I was doing a uh, an emergency planning exercise uh, recently, um, uh, and I honestly oh it was for Limerick. Um, uh, and we do these things every couple of years and we work with FEMA and, and state and local. And I was over in the operations center and, uh, and I was playing my role uh, as, as chairman and we were, you know, had everything staffed up and the screens going and, and lots of activity. And, um, and uh, 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 one of the managers that we had in our nuclear security and incident response group said, okay, this is the part where I take you into this back room and I brief you. And so I said, okay, great. And we went in and we sat down and he gave me the spiel about what was happening at the plant under this exercise scenario. And I said, fantastic. Now say it again in English. <laughs> uh, because, right, I, I mean, everybody, you know, I'm not necessarily a technical person, but I also knew that I was in my role in this instance, I was going to have to go explain what was going on. If this was a real situation, I was going to have to go explain what was going on to National Security Council, to the Secretary of Homeland Security, to the Secretary of Energy, et cetera, right? And I needed that uh, in, in plain English. And he kind of caught up a little bit and he went, he kind of took a breath and he said, okay. And then we did it again and it was great. And it's that kind of, you know, we're, we're a technical agency. We're a technical regulator. We're really good at that. Um, um, but sometimes, you know, there, there's what's that this cliche, right? I have to go home and explain it to, to, uh, to my mom or to my sister or whatever, who aren't in the agency. I think there's, I, I think there's some more we could do there. Okay, next question. Um, given the variety of advanced nuclear technologies, do you think NRC should move away from prescriptive regulation? Well, I see that kind of like the, the, um, the situation a couple of, of uh, questions ago, right? Where, where is, there is this kind of more prescriptive end that is, that's predictable. And, and, there's the, and then there's the, flexi there's the flexibility. And I did, I did talk, I think, in my speech quite a bit about the need for flexibility and for performance-based approaches, right? Where we're focused on the outcome uh, and, and um, uh, less on prescribing specific methodologies for getting to that outcome. Now, that doesn't mean that any methodology is okay, right? It's the show your work. We, we get to validate whether those methodologies for, um, for assessing or for uh, meeting the requirements of those performance-based criteria are adequate. Because again, if they're not, or if, if we think that they don't work in some way, it calls into question the conclusions, which is ultimately what we're about. We're about safety conclusions. So, um, so it's gonna, it's gonna depend. It depends. And we have time for one more question. Um, you mentioned data in your speech. Can you talk more about, you're very busy, so can you talk more about how you and your staff use data or data analytics to make your job easier or how you use it in your day-to-day -day interactions? Yeah, great question. I mean, certainly in a couple of key areas. I mean, one is is uh, certainly on the budget and 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 internal processes, um, right? I've, I've, I've worked in CFO offices and so I'm like, Give me all the information, <laughs> um, and and uh, and the CIO has really done a great job, I think, recently of of um, uh, turning that data into information. And then I would say, in you know, in other areas, it's uh, in a lot of the papers. I, I use it quite a, a bit, just just in in papers. I mean, um, 
uh, uh, medical technologies, right, where we have a lot of data about um, uh, the use of radioactive materials and um, and what issues might arise with those. You see it in um, uh, um, some of the fuel papers we've seen and some of the other um, uh, uh, nuclear papers we've seen, whether that's the ISI, IST inspections or other kinds of things, right? So what is, you know, what does the data tell us and how can we use that to kind of inform moving forward? So I'm, I'm uh, you know, really um, uh, constantly asking staff about, okay, well, let's, let's gather the data on this and let's see what that says. And then let's Let's kind of um, kind of move forward. And I have to say, I mean, we've used on a number of occasions too the tools that we've got out there that are MapX and and uh, you know um, uh, other kind of performance um, uh, data on the plants. So, well, Chairman, thank you so much for breaking the ice and opening our second virtual, a little bit in person. Um, Rick, your expert remarks and for fueling the questions. And with that, I close the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Ray.